Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. This is session number 297. And this evening, we are going to be, we are nearly finished. Well, we're pretty close to finished uh, with the sequence in front of the doors of Durin here. Tonight, the ripples in the dreadful pool and the answer to the riddle both are drawing nearer uh, to us here. So um, we are... Um, uh, we will, we will, we will see both of these those things in parallel. Last time, we were looking at the we got to the part where, of course, Boromir throws the rock out into the pool, uh, and we were looking at how this what this sort of suggested about his frame of mind there, um, and then we were. Uh, but then, of course, we've been spending a lot of time talking about uh, Gandalf as well. So, like, the two things that are going on here, um, and it's really interesting the way that Tolkien is balancing them, isn't it? Um, you've got the drama, like the big kind of flashy drama of Gandalf trying to get in through the doors and failing so far, um, uh, rather sort of extravagantly, right? And the sort of concern of, uh, you know, everyone else's confidence in what's going to happen next and all that sort of thing, right? Um, but then we also have the pool, um, which has been an issue, right, ever since we've met it um, and has been slowly growing sort of in the background. Um, that's the, I want to look at the balance of that tonight um, and uh, and then move forward. So I doubt we'll get the, to the doors actually opening tonight, Dizzy, but it'll be, we'll see. We'll see. Um, but um, anyway, uh, so, but first, quick announcement before we uh, go any further. Um, we are coming up soon on our next moot. It is going to be Tex Moot soon. Back to, back to Texas again. We're going back to Houston in Texas this year. So that's going to be on Saturday, uh, April 6th. Uh, so just a week and a half from today, we'll be down there um, in um, uh, in Texas. Really looking forward to, um, uh, to seeing folks down there in Texas again. One of our longest running uh, annual moots down in Texas. Um, always such a great group down there. Uh, so it'll be uh, it'll be great fun to 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 see. I know there are several of you of uh, the regulars here that I uh, that I often get to see down at Tex Moot. Looking forward to that. Um, and uh, uh, and of course, anyone can join us, even if you can't get to Houston, you can still join us. All of our uh, moots are available as a hybrid experience so you can join us from home. And when you do so, um, when you sign up to attend the moot remotely, you also get recordings of everything. So even if you can't be there for the whole day, you can catch up on things um, that you uh, that you missed before. So anyway, that is going on. Tex moot is coming soon. And after that, the UK moot. Um, we'll be going over uh, be going over to England later in April uh, to for, to do our our first moot back in Europe that we've done since 2019. So very, very excited for that. All right. Um, let's get back to the text here. So this is the passage. Um, uh, uh, this is the passage we looked at last time, but we didn't discuss the whole thing. So we'll, we'll, we'll finish up with this. And then we've been doing, we've been doing these like bridge, uh, uh, <laughs> bridged half discussions of passages lately. Um, but anyway, let's, 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 let's reread it here. At that moment, from far off, the wind bore to their listening ears the howling of wolves. Bill the pony started in fear, and Sam sprang to his side and whispered softly to him. Do not let him run away, said Boromir. It seems that we shall need him still if the wolves do not find us. How I hate this foul pool. He stooped, and picking up a large stone, he cast it far into the dark water. The stone vanished with a soft slap, but at the same instant there was a swish and a bubble. Great rippling rings formed on the surface, out beyond where the stone had fallen, and they moved slowly towards the foot of the cliff. "'Why did you do that, Boromir?' said Frodo. "'I hate this place, too, and I am afraid. I don't know of what, not of wolves, or the darkness behind the doors, but of something else. I'm afraid of the pool. Don't disturb it.' "'I wish we could get away,' said Mary. 
Why doesn't Gandalf do something quick? Said Pippin. Um, okay, so first let's look at what actually occurs, right? Make sure that we're perfectly clear on the actual events. Boromir throws the pool, throws the pool. He wishes he could throw the pool. He throws the stone out into the pool and we're told that he casts it far into the dark water, right? So it, um, it goes way out into the pool. Um, at the same instant, there was a swish and a bubble. So these two other sounds is the soft slap. Um, and of course, the um, notice all of the the not, not just, uh, the yes, there's alliteration, but notice the, the the shape of all of these sibilants in this sentence, right? The stone vanished with a soft slap, but at the same instant there was a swish and a bubble, right? Uh, stone vanished, soft slap, same instant swish. Um, uh, so many, um, um, so many sibilants in that sentence. Great rippling rings formed on the surface out beyond where the stone had fallen, and they moved slowly towards the foot of the cliff. Um, yes, the great rippling rings, uh, the R's there. Yes, yes. Um, so, but again, don't want to get so caught up in the sound of the sentences that we're losing track of what happens. So there's the soft slap of the stone on the water. Then at the same instant, there is a swish and a bubble. Totally different sounds, not a direct consequence of the throwing of the stone. So there is evidence of something else moving out on the surface of the water where Boromir threw. So Boromir throws the stone far into the dark water, right? Uh, so this is quite a ways away from them, um, but something out there moves, and the great rippling rings formed on the surface out beyond where the stone had fallen. So to make it perfectly clear, like if you throw a rock out into a pool, ripples will form and they will move outward in concentric circles from that splash point. But they're not going to be very big, most likely, right? I mean, unless you're heaving a very large rock, which Boromir is not. He is taking a large... It's, it's a large stone, but it clearly fits in his hand because he's casting it far into the deep water. Um, uh, and um, so, yes, yeah, so it's... On the one hand, again, the rippling rings forming... Um, and moving slowly towards the foot of the cliff, there is something about that which is supposed to be like what naturally happens. But, it, but we have the, the, the one clear and the one sort of less clear um, indication that this is not just the normal ripples that come from throwing a stone into still water, right? The, the sort of the less clear one is the fact that they're great rippling rings, right? Um, th th it seems a little bit more than might be explained by the throwing of a single rock out there. Um, the second thing is the point of origin, right? It says specifically, they formed on the surface beyond where the stone had fallen and moved slowly towards the foot of the hill. Um, so we know for certain that we, we have heard something move, the swish and bubble, something broke the surface out beyond where the rock hit. And these great rippling rings, the disturbance on the surface of the water is coming from whatever it was beyond where the rock lands. Um, so, Josh, it is, of course, possible and I was thinking about this, that the great rippling rings, it is conceivable that they're not great in sense of amplitude, um, but um, that the diameter of it is great and has been, and has been growing. Um, I, uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, and here's the main 
reason that I say. Um, first, uh, so Josh, the reason that I that I, I I don't agree with that reading is that it they're described as great when they form, right? This is not a question of small ripples formed, right? And you know, small rings formed, and the rings became great over time. Um, but um, but they they're great when they form, right? So I, that's why I I think it's it's pretty clear. The other thing, if you've ever if you've I mean, if you've ever thrown a rock out far out into a deep pool, um, by the time the ripples get to the, I mean the the ripples smooth out over time, right? Um, so even if you throw you know a rock the size of a you know a softball or something um, out into the water, um, it'll make a pretty big splash, and you know the the rings will form and go. But by the time they've gone, you know any distance they smooth out um they smooth out and by the time they you might be able to track them all the way you know to the edge of the shore of the pool by where you're standing but by the time they get there they're um uh they're much they're much smaller right um the view of ripples moving slowly towards the foot of the cliff right um I just love, um, and yes, certainly a rock hitting the water would typically form rings at the point where it hit, yes, and not some distance away, for sure, for sure. Um, the indirectness of that image, right? Because, Josh, but anyway, look, I'm really glad that you brought this up because this is clearly what Tolkien is playing with, right? He's describing this in a way that... On the one hand, like when you look at what he says, it's very clear. This is not just from the stone, right? But what he describes is enough like what would normally happen. That if you're scared and you want to convince yourself that it's going to be okay, you could talk yourself into it, right? As you're looking at the rippling waves moving towards the cliff, you can say, those are probably just the you know, the ripples from Boromir's stone, right? Moving without diminishment towards the cliff, right? Um, uh, yes, yes. Um, but again, it, it's perfectly clear that that's not what's happening, right? Um, but, uh, but he's very, Tolkien that is, is very low key in describing this. Um, we're not told. Like, he doesn't say there's a monster out there. And the monster in the water is slowly approaching them beneath the surface. Um, you know, we don't get the Jaws theme playing or anything like that, right? Um, all he is describing is the great rippling ring which are moving slowly towards the foot of the cliff. Like ripples, rippling rings do in ponds. Nothing nothing to see here, right? But exactly as Emily says, he also doesn't not say it. Yes, exactly. He gives us enough reason to see that um, there is definitely something else going on. As Eric was pointing out earlier, um, the swish and the bubble comes at the same instant. This is not a reaction. This is not like Boromir throws the rock, the rock hits the water, and then, you know, a few seconds after the... It, like, there's no sense that he disturbed it. I, I don't think. Right? Um, because it happens at the same instant. It's already there. They're simultaneous. Um, yes... Matt, that's a perfect way to say it. Um, in his description, Matt says Tolkien is offering implausible deniability. Um, yes. Should you choose to deny, should you want to deny what is in fact happening, he gives you the ability, right, to choose to make that choice, even though it's implausible. Um, and it certainly does increase the suspense, uh, Maureen. Um, but notice how this move, and by the way, the two other verbs 
well, all three of the verbs that he uses um, about the sound of the water are really unsettling in their different ways, right? First, the slap of the stone. And several of you guys have been talking about this, and I completely agree with you. Um, the idea of the s it, that it makes a slap when it hits the water, the rock makes a slap when it hits the water, instead of, you know, like a nice... Um, a nice, pleasant, like, bloosh sound or something like that. It, um, it, um, it does give the vague impression that this water doesn't react like, like that. We were told already that this, this, uh, is an unwholesome looking lake, right? And this gives the vague impression that it's like, is it even water? Like, is it, does it have the viscosity of water? I mean, it sounds like it's more viscous than normal water. I, I, I agree with that. Um, it sounds almost like mud or something like that, right? It's, it is, JJ, as you say, very uncanny water. Um, so even, even the, the description of the rock hitting the water is unsettling in that way. But then swish and bubble. Again, though you may, if you, especially if you are a hobbit who is really trying to hold it together right now and trying to focus on Gandalf and the opening door and hoping that you're going to be away from this pool very soon so you don't have to worry about anything, um, you might choose to embrace the implausible deniability that Tolkien the narrator is giving us here, right? But those two verbs, swish and bubble, swish, that's the movement of a living thing, right? That's, that has nothing to do with any sound that a rock makes when it hits the surface of a pond, right? A swish is the sound of a living thing in water. And bubble? A bubble is even more disturbing because that's like the sound of a breathing thing, right? Or something that, uh, yeah, Jackie, something's alive down there, right? Um, and this was, this was the thing that has not been clear at any point about the pond, about this disgusting lake. That it was unwholesome looking was clear from the beginning. Like it is stagnant and the rocks in it are greasy, and it feels unclean on their feet as they wade through it. Um, the hobbits describe this. Um, Boromir is obviously afraid and doesn't know how to handle it. His throwing of the rock, as we said last time, seemed to be the action of a very frustrated man of action who can do nothing. He can do nothing to open the door. He can do nothing. About, and this pool is completely outside. Um, uh, is completely outside uh, his experience. Like, he's no idea what to do with it. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Mudmore I assume it is a bit of an assumption when it says he picks up a large stone and casts it. I am assuming he's throwing it one handed like a baseball. Yes. When it's when he says a large stone, I think that means like a small. If it, if it had said he picked up a small stone, I'd be picturing not a pebble, but like a, you know, a, a stone you might try skipping or something like that, like a little river stone, a large stone. Again, I'm thinking something more like the size of a. You know, yeah, a baseball, cricket ball, that kind of size of stone. Um, and he throws it far into the dark water. Now, there's a, there is a, a, a direction for us, the readers here, right? Um, Boromir's casting the large stone far into the dark water is an answer to the question, why doesn't the Watcher attack them sooner than it does, Right? And the answer is, because it's still far away. At this moment, we know, we're told where it is. It's beyond where Boromir's 
stone landed. So let's assume the stone isn't that big and that Boromir's got a pretty good arm. So, you know, he probably throws that thing... Um, I'd say he could throw it quite a ways, right? At least 200 feet, right? So, you know... I don't know, what would that be? Something like 70, 75 meters, something like that, right? Boromir's a good arm. Um, and um, and it's further away than that, right? And moving and coming closer, right? Um, yeah, Johnny, that would be really fun to do. Um of course, it's hard because it was dark and they made it dark in the film. And so it's hard to show the water in the dark. But I love Johnny's suggestion of showing like the ripples from the stone and then the new set of ripples overtaking the ripples of the stone. Right. That would be very unsettling and really cool. Um, but um, uh, anyway, um yeah, but it's it's de it definitely started moving before the stone hit, in fact. Because at the same instant, there was a swish and a bubble. Um, also, we've talked about this before. They've walked through the water. I mean, if, if ripples in the water, I doubt Boromir hit it with the stone. Right? This is not a question of the watcher in the water being asleep out in the surface of the water, way out in the lake. Boromir throws a rock hits it with the rock and is like, what? Uh, what uh, hey, somebody's there. I better go attack them. Like, I don't, um, uh, I really don't, I really don't think so. Um, but, um, yeah, well, see, Kalauras, I, you know, I was trying to be conservative, plus a rock is heavier than a baseball. So, um, you know, would Boromir be able to throw somebody out at home from center from center field, 350 feet away, on the fly, no bounces? Um, quite, not, nothing could be likelier. Nothing could be likelier. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but, but, you know, I was trying to be conservative. I was trying to be conservative. Um, anyway, it's a ways out, and it doesn't seem to be coming very quickly, right? Um, they moved slowly towards the foot of the hill. The ripples do. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, let's go back for a second. Remember what? Okay, didn't have them here. Hang on. Yeah, no, right here on this side. Not the side before. Um, Boromir says, how I hate this foul pool. And Frodo says, I hate this place too, and I am afraid. I don't know of what. Not of wolves or the dark behind the doors, but of something else. I'm afraid of the pool. Don't disturb it. What's going on? Why? Is Boromir so unsettled by this pool? He, which is very clear that he's very unsettled by the pool. Frodo speaks of it a little bit more, with a little bit more self-awareness there. We have seen, there has been a general sense We can see many places in Tolkien where the presence of a you know malevolent thing creates a physical desolation. The desol the you know the desolation of Smaug is the first obvious example that we get of this, right? Of course, we see the you know Enfalgleth and Tarnufuin and stuff like that in the Silmarillion, right? Um, obviously, we get the the brown lands and um, Dagorlad and the and the dead marshes right around Mordor. Um, we see uh, uh, Isengard and what comes of Isengard after Sar Saruman turns. That whole trend is really um, uh, is really is really clear. Um, 
to some extent, that seems to be happening here as well. I'm thinking back in particular to the earlier descriptions. Remember the, like, lovely avenue of holly trees which have been choked and drowned by the lake, right? So there's that same kind of dynamic of a place once green and cheerful and friendly. Um, remember that, you know, the the even the waterfall itself, right? The stream was like used to be all cheerful and noisy and now it's not, right? Um, so to some extent, that kind of description of like the corruption and desolation of the landscape which tends to surround somebody evil in Tolkien's world has been like what we have seen in the description of this lake. Um, but I think what we're seeing here, I think that there is what Boromir is... Like, why does Boromir hate the pool? Yeah, it's ugly. Sure. It's nasty. Um, why does he hate it? Why is he afraid of it? Why is it bothering him so much? And when Frodo responds, Frodo was a little bit more analytical about it. I hate this place too, and I'm afraid. I don't know of what... Not of wolves or the dark behind the door, but of something else. I'm afraid of the pool. Um, they have no idea. I mean, they don't speak of the possibility of a denizen of the pool. Right? None of them seem to have any clear sense or even any kind of concrete fear of that. But that they seem to be detecting that. I, I I think it's clear. When Frodo says, like, notice he's, he talks about the wolves. He talks about the dark behind the doors. That is, he talks about the dangers. But what he's really afraid of, he identifies, is the pool. And the thing is, um, the pool is not dangerous. I mean, I wouldn't drink it, right? But you know, apart from the kind of dangers it might have intestinally, you know, if you drank the water, um, it's, um, it's no threat to them. The wolves are a threat. The dark behind the door is like, you know, Moria getting lost in Moria, running into orcs in Moria or whatever it was that chased the dwarves out in the first place. Um, there's a lot to be afraid of in Moria. It's a lot of dangers in Moria. This pool isn't dangerous. It's, it's, it's not going to get them. It's one again. Boromir's impulse to physically strike out at the pool really kind of emphasizes this, right? He he attacks the pool. He strikes out as we were saying last time with a kind of um, um, defiance against the pool. Why? Why would you do that? I mean, that's not how you respond to ugliness. That's not how you respond to even like this place has bad vibes and makes me feel creepy. Um, Boromir, the warrior, attacks the pond, right? I mean, we, again, we talked about this some last time and we were kind of joking about it in some ways and it's easy to make jokes about it. But that is to say, there is a sense in which Boromir, Bor Boromir feels that there is an enemy here. And um, unaccountably, he's connecting it to the pool. Um, <laughs> Freebird says at least he didn't blow his horn at it. Though he might as well at this point, right? I mean, what's the downside? Um, I mean, it's, the wolves are pursuing them by scent anyway. Um, but, um, yes. And I agree, Jack Rabbit. you're right that it's not just a fear response he's having. He is also having a disgust response as well. This foul pool, he calls it. Um, 
Yes, yes. It is not only like sort of dangerous, but um, uh, but uh, but it's it is also disgusting as well. Yes, um, and yes, there is the added tension and frustration of not being able to open the door. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and yes, Jackie, the pool is at their backs as they face the doors. But this sense has been growing. This sense has been growing that there is. Remember, Boromir identified this as like a two-body problem, or at least like a two-threat matrix. Um, there was the doors and the dark behind the doors, and there's the wolves. Remember Boromir being like, and, you know, being caught between the wall, the wolves and the wall, you know, seems the likeliest chance. Um, those were the two things. And, re and notice Frodo remembers that, right? He brings up both of those things. It's not the wolves. It's not the dark behind the doors. Those were the two things that we, and you particularly, Boromir, identified before as the two threats, as the two things to be afraid of, right? But they've all been increasingly getting the sense that there was a third thing. Um, I think that they can tell that there's some... They're, they are slowly getting the sense... And Frodo is the one who articulates it most clearly here. That there is, in fact, a third threat. And Frodo has now pinned down the fact. Boromir's throwing of the stone um, seems to be the thing that draws it to his attention, right? Um, when Boromir throws the rock out into the water, Frodo's like, why did you do that? Um, but it seems to, like, help him to put it together. I am afraid of the pool. That there is a third thing to be afraid of here, and I'm, my fear of that, I'm more afraid of this inert body of water than I am of the wolves that are pursuing us, or of the, um, you know, the, like, orc-infested death trap that we are attempting uh, and the, thus far failing to enter into, right? Um... Yeah, so for Thoughtless, I agree. It is Frodo specifically that notices the threat. Does the ring make him more sensitive to the presence of evil will? Um, it's a really difficult question to answer. Um, or his wound. We don't get any indication. That is, we're not... We don't get any hint of one kind or another that he is sensing something like, you know, that his shoulder's aching or something like that. Um, I don't know. It's possible. It's possible. I guess that's all I feel that I can really say, is that we can't really rule it out. I don't... I am not inclined to attribute much to the ring here as far as Frodo's perceptions are considered. Mostly because I agree with Bjorning, Boromir feels it too. Boromir senses it too. There is, um, there is a sense in which Boromir's action of throwing the stone out into the lake is quite the right action. That is, we, we were talking, I mean, when we were kind of joking about it and remembering, you know, like... Um, uh, wasn't it wasn't it Caligula who declared war on Neptune that was Caligula or was it Nero one of the crazy Roman emperors um, you know one, one of the one of the crazy Claudians it was Caligula yeah um, who declared war on, on, on Neptune and, and had the legions advance into the tide right um, there are ways in which throwing the rock at the pond uh in order to, you know, vent your anger and attack a body of water starts to feel a little Caligula-ish, right? Um, but, um, but of course, it turns out he's quite correct. The pond does, in fact, contain an enemy which is indeed about to attack them. Like, uh, turning away, turning your back to the door and your face to the pond, ready to take aggressive action against the pond is in fact right like that's that's that is 
that is not a wrong impulse here. Um, again, I'm not saying that Boromir is like that. It's good that Boromir threw the stone or something. I'm just saying that I don't think that Boromir's. I don't think we can even say that his perception is incorrect. I think his impulse is right here. Um, uh, was it going to attack them without the large stone? I think it was. Absolutely, I think it was. Um, again, I come back to the point that Eric has been emphasizing, and I I, I agree with it um, that um, that the swish and the bubble come at the same instant. You know, it's not like the rock. Okay, I said I wasn't going to talk about this last time, but I'll talk about it very, very briefly, and then we'll wait until we get to the passage. When Pippin drops the rock, we're talking, you know, Pippin's rock and Boromir's rock. When Pippin drops the rock down the well, it makes a sound, finally, when it eventually hits. And then some time passes, and then more sounds come, right? That seems to suggest that the rock, in fact, drew somebody's attention, right? And what we are seeing is the eventual consequences of the rock striking the bottom, right? Um, that isn't what happens here, right? This isn't the rock slaps on the surface of the water. There is a pause for minutes or even seconds before there is then a movement in response to it, as if he had woken up the thing with the rock and when the rock hits the thing wakes up comes up towards the surface and then the swishing and bubbling begins um that isn't what happens um at the same instant that the rock hits the surface of the water the swish and the bubble is already happening dizzy i think that's actually very likely um does the stone tossing make the company focus on the water at that moment to notice the swish and the bubble? Yeah, might the swish and the bubble have happened anyway? Um, but they might not have been looking in that direction. Um, might uh, great rippling rings have formed on the surface and begun moving slowly towards the foot of the cliff, even if all their backs were turned? They just wouldn't have been seeing it, right? Um that seems to me very likely, actually. Um, it is conceivable to me, Jackie, that... So J Jackie says, I think throwing the rock might have delayed the Watcher's attack, uh, giving them a chance to retreat into the mines. Of the two options, if I had to say, does, the, does Boromir's throwing of the rock um, induce or inhibit the attack of the Watcher? I think it's more likely than it that it inhibits it, inhibits it of the two. I can't make the other one work. It, it's too instantaneous, right? It's simultaneous, right? Um, so I don't I, I don't think that that can be the case. Is it? You know, I don't think it's really likely that it stops him a, a very great deal, right? Um, but is it possible? Is it possible that it in some way um, what? makes him approach more cautiously than he might have done? I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Aranas, I completely agree with you. I mean, I think if the casting of the stone into the water were to be... If that were to be a thing that would wake up the Watcher, then all, all nine of them plus the pony wading through a section of the water would surely be enough disturbance of the water to wake it up, right? Um, yeah. Bjorning, I think it's a really, really good way to say it. Um, it's unknowable if Boromir hindered the Watcher, but it's certain that Boromir alerted the company to the threat. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> Kurtzman says, so actually they should have kept throwing rocks. Um, <laughs> maybe. Maybe, right? I mean, I th when Frodo says, why did you do that? Don't disturb it. I, I think that sounds like desperation to me, right? Like Frodo is has the vague sense that there is something, not just vaguely the pond, but that there is something in the water to be afraid of. And 
he has this sort of desperate hope that it might remain undisturbed and not come out and eat them, right? Um, yeah, maybe we didn't aggro it yet. Exactly, Abelard, exactly. Um, uh, yes, yeah, exactly. Bjorning, I agree. Um, Frodo is wise to sense the threat, but he freezes rather than taking action. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, I love... Notice the way that things start to shift here. I wish we could get away, said Mary, voicing the feeling of increasing panic. Especially, I assume, as they're look, watching the ripples approach the shore. Right? We've had this vague sense of unease about this pond, and now it really kind of looks like something is swimming towards us inside the pond. Right? Um... And then Pippin's saying, why doesn't Gandalf do something quick? What I love about that question is it's, it's so like, so if we go back a little bit, hang on, um, go back to the comment, let's see. Right, here, here it is. The comment that Pippin... The question that Pippin asks that leads um, Gandalf to want to knock on the doors with his head. What are you going to do then? Um, knock on the doors with your head, Peregrine took, right? Um, what are you going to do, Gandalf? How are you going to fix this problem, Gandalf? Right, is what Pippin already said about the opening of the doors. So, on the one hand, he says it again, right? Why doesn't Gandalf do something quick? Which echoes what he said before about the opening of the doors. But now, he's not thinking about the doors, right? What he wants Gandalf to, you know, it's, though it's kind of vague. Why doesn't Gandalf do something quick? Um, and he's open to possibilities here, right? Should Gandalf want to do something about the monster that seems to be approaching them in the pond? That would probably be, be helpful if he would like to open the doors immediately so that they can get through, get out of here and escape from whatever's in the pond, that also would be quite acceptable, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, but but again, the, the emphasis has changed from Boromir's uh, comments in picking up the stone and throwing the stone onward the shift of the reader. And I just, I love how delicately Tolkien introduces the idea of the monster in the pool. Right? I mean, again, we come in with this big dilemma. They're, you know, should they even go through Moria in the first place? Is that crazy or what? Right? Okay, but they're going to go through. It seems like a really bad idea, but they're going to go through. And now the wolves are chasing them. Right. And, you know, it's likely they're going to get trapped between the, the wolves and the wall. And then they show up at the wall and Gandalf can't even open the doors. Right. Um, doesn't know the way. It, excuse me. Doesn't know the way in. And um, when he tries to open the doors, he totally fails. Right. Um, so. Um, yeah, I mean, that's. Um, It's a bad situation. And yet, Tolkien interjects, you know, very gently from when they first come up the, you know, the, 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 the path and see the pool in front of them. This unquieting pool. And then the, the, the growing references to it until this point here. Now, all of a sudden, it has suddenly grown into this thing third major element. So that at this point, I wish we could get away. Why doesn't Gandalf do something quick? Um, far from focusing with despair or disapproval on Gandalf's apparent failure to open the doors, no one's even paying attention to Gandalf or to the doors anymore. Right? Everything has shifted. Um...
But Gandalf is the only one in the party. Gandalf is the only one in the party who is not paying a lick of attention to the pond. Gandalf took no notice of them. He sat with his head bowed, either in despair or in anxious thought. The mournful howling of the wolves was heard again. The ripples on the water grew and came closer. Some were already lapping on the shore. With a suddenness that startled them all, the wizard sprang to his feet. He was laughing. I have it, he cried. Of course, of course. Absurdly simple, like most riddles when you see the answer. Picking up his staff, he stood before the rock and said in a clear voice, Melon. I love the disjunction, right? The disconnection between Gandalf and the entire rest of the party here. When Gandalf finally solves the riddle, it feels not like a climax, but like a non sequitur. Everyone else is looking out at the pool, watching the ripples come close trying to convince themselves that there is not something swimming there making those ripples happen, right? Um, and then, at that moment, while they're all watching this, and the, the mournful howling of the wolves is heard again, again, notice the, the increasing tension, all of these things. Gandalf took no notice of them. He sat with his head bowed, either in despair or in anxious thought. The mournful howling of the wolves was heard again. The ripples on the water grew and came closer. Some were already lapping on the shore. Um, the ripples definitely don't grow <laughs> if there's nothing there, right? Um... Notice how they don't describe any of the any of what they feel, right? Starting with the mournful howling of the wolves was heard again. Passive voice, right? They hear the mournful howling of the wolves, but Tolkien doesn't want to say it in the active voice. To say it in the active voice makes it a sentence about them, right? He doesn't want to do that. He instead just wants to make it a sentence about the howling. The mournful howling of the wolves was heard. They're there hearing it. The ripples on the water grew and came closer. Notice how similar this is to the technique that he used back when he was describing like the east wind cutting into their clothes and stuff. Instead of just telling us how they feel, He's describing the things and enabling us to imagine ourselves there. We're hearing the mournful howling of the wolves. We're watching the ripples on the water growing and coming closer. Some already lapping on the shore, right? Um, yeah, I agree, uh, Jackie. Some were already lapping on the shore. It makes me so nervous. Yeah. Anenian, yes, you're right. The, the tension, it is so, um, it is so high. And Abelard, yes, the, the, the competing sounds. Um, the howling of the wolves sounds mournful. The ripples are lapping on the shore. And that sound, the gentle lapping of little waves, right, on the, on the shore of a pond. Again, we've all We've all heard that sound. What a cheerful, pleasant little sound, right? Um, uh, and so, you know, at odds with the terrible tension of this moment. But yes, Jackie, it is also really disturbing under the circumstances because, of course, a pond should not have waves without a pretty strong wind. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, yes, the wolves. I mean, notice how the howling of the wolves is a threat, but it's like it's not even 
there is no chance the wolves are going to get a chance to eat them. <laughs> right. Like, it is, yes, it is coming. It is already, it is already here. Um, um, and then they're all started, startled. It's like the tension gets cut by Gandalf's laughter. Gandalf springs to his feet, not in order to do something quick, as Pippin would have him do as far as, like, against the apparently oncoming threat, which has still not yet revealed itself, right? Um, nor to help them get away, as Mary was hoping he would help them get away. He's laughing, right? Um, he jumps to his feet and starts laughing. Gandalf, the only one in the party who has not, as I say, been paying a bit of attention to the pond. I have it. Of course, of course. Absurdly simple, like most riddles when you see the answer. Picking up his staff, which, remember, he had thrown down on the ground in a petulant fit, he stood before the rock and said in a clear voice, Melon. Um, <laughs> McBombadil... I wonder, I do wonder how the Watcher in the Water responded to Gandalf's laughter. I bet you it wasn't expecting that. I bet you, I bet you it wasn't. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, it's such a wand elf thing to do, uh, Mrs. Manrique. Yeah, it kind of is. Kind of is. Um, yes. Um, absurdly simple, like most riddles when you see the answer. Um, what should we be thinking of? What should we be remembering? When we were on a hilltop chasing wolves away with fire, we were thinking of that scene in The Hobbit with the pine cones and the wolves. When we got to the door, right, we were thinking about thrushes knocking and moon letters. There's been a whole lot of Hobbit memories, memories of the Hobbit, right, that have been going on in these last two chapters. Um, and what has just happened? Gandalf has just, in the nick of time, thought of the answer to a riddle, right? And it comes out like, um, yeah, time. I, give me more time. Yeah, time. Time. Um, yeah, thinking of the riddle game with Gollum in his nasty, unsettling lake beneath the mountain, which Bilbo didn't like the feel of on his hobbit feet. Um, I, and the number of times in which um, Bilbo was saved by pure luck and that sort of thing, right? Um, now, Josh, it is certainly true that Gandalf does not accidentally stumble on the correct word here. But yes, there is a riddle game next to a pool, as Dr. Benway says, and it's not the, the kind of the play here. Remember that the last two riddles, answers, I mean, to riddles, that Bilbo gets in the riddle game, um, by the way, I just... I was just, I'm rereading The Hobbit. Um, <laughs> my son was teasing me. I picked him up from school and my, you know, my car Bluetooth had picked up my phone. And so I was, uh, I'd been listening to The Hobbit while driving to school to pick him up. So he gets in the car and he sees, you know, he sees on the display that I'm listening to The Hobbit. He's like, ah, trying something new, are you? And I'm like, yeah, I thought I'd, I thought I'd give it a whirl. I hear it's good. Anyway, I'm rereading The Hobbit. Um, and I just reread Riddles in the Dark today, so this is sort of particularly fresh to me. But in any case, um, the 
the last two riddles, the last two riddles that that Bilbo answers, he answers um, he answers by accident, right? It's you know there's pure luck involved, as the narrator of the Hobbit says, right? The fish riddle that um, is answered when a fish leaps out of the pool and is cold and slimy on Bilbo's feet. And then the time riddle, which indeed he doesn't only, um, you know, have the answer signaled to him by luck, but in fact answers correctly accidentally, right? Um, uh, I'm not saying, of course, that Gandalf's answer comes to him in the same way. Um, he doesn't... He f sees the answer, right? I have it, he cried, right? Um, he finally realizes not the answer to the puzzle that he's been trying to puzzle out. He finally realizes that he's been thinking, as we said last time, in the wrong direction completely the whole way, right? But where it feels like the riddle game, that other guessing of riddles by a nasty, creepy lake with uh, slimy things that you never know what you're going to find um, uh, in a lake. You know, in these pools deep in mountains. Um, the Hobbit narrator, of course, was suggesting, uh, you know, sort of like nasty, bug-eyed fish, but, um, but of course it was making me think of the Watcher in the Water. Anyway, um, the point is the similarity that I'm seeing here is not in Gandalf's solving of the riddle. Um, what I'm seeing is in the stroke of coincidence here, right? The stroke of... Again, Gandalf, I think, is wholly unaware of the fact that something in the pool is swimming towards them at this moment, right? He's just been thinking about the riddle. And he's just finally solved it. And the very, um, well, not inappropriateness exactly, that's not quite the right thing. The very um, sort of uh, oddity, right? The, again, the non sequitur feeling of his response. The increasing tension especially in that first paragraph that we were just reading, right? The mournful howling and the ripples on the water. And then Gandalf lapping. Laughing, not lapping. That's what the ripples are doing. Gandalf laughing, right? I mean, notice the way he says that. With a suddenness that startled them all, the wizard sprang to his feet. If that's all we have, right, what comes next? Well, Gandalf's going to do something quick. Is he gonna? Is he about to like what? Call fire down in order to save them from whatever it is that's about to come out of the pool, right? Um, but then we get that second sentence. He was laughing, and there's a kind of like amazement in the tone of that sentence. Gandalf is is laughing. Gandalf is totally out of touch with the rest of the scene and the rest of everything that's happening, right? But at that moment, at the very moment when the tension was unbearable and the danger is coming in on them, he suddenly thinks of the answer. And he's standing there laughing while the rest of them are staring in terror at the lake. I have it. Absurdly simple like most riddles when you see the answer. Picking up his staff, he stood before the rock. Note, that means with his back full against the encroaching ripples, which are already lapping on the shore of the, of the pond of the lake, and says in a clear voice, Friend! So yes, Kung Tater, I agree. Fast and decisive movement from Gandalf would get everyone's attention pretty fast. Especially, again, Pippin just said, why doesn't Gandalf do something quick? Well, there he is. He just did something quick, right? Um, but so yeah, the laughter had to double the surprise. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I 
Yeah, yeah. And then he says, friend, really loudly. Um, the breaking of the tension here is fascinating, right? Um, fascinating the way the fear of the pond has grown and grown and now, you know, reaches this almost unbearable tension and then we just, whoop, get pulled right out of it. Right? Picking up his staff, he stood before the rock and said in a queer voice, Melon. Now, we won't get too far, but let's just watch what happens right after this. The star shone out briefly and faded again. Then silently a great doorway was outlined, though not a crack or joint had been visible before. Slowly it divided in the middle and swung outwards inch by inch until both doors lay back against the wall. Through the opening a shadowy stair could be seen climbing steeply up, but beyond the lower steps the darkness was deeper than the night. The company stared in wonder. I was wrong after all, said Gandalf, and Gimli too. Mary, of all people, was on the right track. The opening word was inscribed on the archway all the time. The translation should have been, say friend and enter. I had only to speak the elvish word for friend and the doors opened. Quite simple. Too simple for a learned lore master in these suspicious days. Those were happier times. Now, let us go. N Notice what just happened? Everyone, including us, including the readers, are staring at the door. Yeah, the focus has entirely shifted all of a sudden from this, like, staring with horrible anticipation at the ripples on the surface of the pond to staring at the door. The star, the star shone briefly and faded. And, and this is not quick. This is not like an... This is not just looking over our shoulders for a second. Right? Silently, a great doorway was outlined, though not a cracker joint had been visible before. Slowly, it divided in the middle and swung outwards, inch by inch, until both doors lay back against the wall, all the way back against the wall. Through the opening, a shadowy stair could be seen, climbing steeply up. But beyond the lower steps, the darkness was deeper than the night. The company stared in wonder. How long do you make it? From the moment Gandalf says the word melon, based on this description, how long would you guess it is? From the moment Gandalf says the word melon until Gandalf says the words, I was wrong after all. Seconds? A lot of seconds, though inch by inch, silently, slowly, inch by inch. I, I think it's, it's got to be at least a minute, right? Even if we say 30 seconds. It could happen, right? Inch by inch, the doors are going, right? But even 30 seconds. The ripples had begun to lap at the edge of the, of the pool, right? They had arrived. If ripples are being formed on the surface of the water because something large is swimming under the water and pushing the water in front of it, it's not far behind the waves, right? And yes, the doors open the full 180 until they're back against the wall. They don't just crack open a little bit. They open all the way, inch by inch, right? Um, maybe 30 seconds. But I think probably even longer. In any case, um, 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, whatever it was, that is way more time than we thought we had when we were looking at the pool, right? Um, the, 
the attack from the water seemed absolutely um, absolutely imminent. And now everyone, the company, all of them who were just staring at the pool thinking whatever they were afraid of was about to come towards them, they're now all standing with their backs to the pool. Right? Staring in the door. The Watcher itself um, seems, what, to have stopped? It not only waits until the door's open, um, but Gandalf gets his whole explanatory speech in. Right? Well, and Eric, yeah, I was, I was, I mean, I was half joking about it too. That Gandalf, the reader, and the company of the ring all stop and stare at the doors. And the watcher is due, right? Um, but, um, Yeah, it really does seem, it seems to me a little improbable under the circumstances that I don't know given that the ripples form, made, created by the Watcher were had already reached the shore it's very difficult for me to imagine that the Watcher is still just not in range. Is still, like, approaching, getting into range during this whole sequence that the doors are opening. Um, yeah, McBombadil says, I think the, um, uh, the, the, the laughter stalled it. Well, I wonder... I wonder. I mean, that seems to me to be the strangest thing about this moment. If it were merely that all of the company had been feeling tense and upset, right, and getting increasingly freaked out, and then Gandalf laughs and opens the door and speaks to them cheerfully, right, about, um, uh, you know, the happier times and such. And then they all feel, and like the spell is broken. The spell which was even laid on us, the readers, as our own fear and dread and tension was growing and growing. If it had just been that, then, okay. Like, fair enough. But there was action in the middle of happening, right? Um, I mean, it was approaching. Why did it stop? That it has to have stopped. I think it has to have. Johnny, it does feel a little bit like Aragorn singing, keeping the Nazgul back at Weathertop. Yeah, yeah. Um, how is it? Is it. First of all, let us acknowledge that we know and honestly we have so little data about the Watcher in the Water that it's really hard to draw any conclusions firmly about it at all. Right? It's one of the reasons why I'm kind of emphasizing this because this is a, an indirectly stated... We're not told that the thing stopped. But of course, we hadn't been told that the thing was moving either. Right? All of that stuff has been inferred based on the descriptions. But based on those descriptions... So no, Dr. Benway, I don't think Gandalf is aware of the danger and his laughter is calculated to delay the Watcher. That's what reminds me of the end of the Riddle game. There is something 
happening by luck, something hap a stroke of you catastrophe. Just as at the end of Bilbo's riddle game by an unquieting pool, he was saved by pure luck, right? The you catastrophic leaping of the fish, the you catastrophic stumble of his voice as he tried to ask for more time, both of them led to, you know, the unexpectedly positive outcome of the riddle game. Here, um, the jarring, unexpected to everybody, laughter of Gandalf, and then turning and opening and solving the riddle. The riddle isn't solved by you catastrophe. The solving of the riddle is the you catastrophe. And it's the you catastrophe that interrupts breaking the tension of that moment um, in this shocking way. This way that seems in some sense, even to have shocked the Watcher himself. What would have happened? Not if Gandalf didn't think of the answer. What if Gandalf had thought of the answer two minutes later? Right? Um, that is, what if there had not been that interruption? Would the Watcher have attacked? What would have happened to them? You know, had they attacked at that point? Um, uh, they would have been trapped between the wall and the watcher. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Well, we'll see. Yes. Very good. Uh, Little Room Johnny was remembering another place where... Um, Someone is laughing, laughing where laughter had never been heard. And yes, the answer is Kira Thungol. Um, when Frodo laughs in response to Sam's impression of uh, like the kid who, you know, uh, you know, I want to hear more about Frodo's uh, dad. Right. Um, the famousest of the hobbits. Right. That's what makes uh, Frodo laugh. Um, uh and his laughter rings through the stones and Sam reflects on how unlikely that has been to have been happening there for a long time. Maureen, there is a certain similarity with Eowyn's laughter as well. Eowyn's laughter in the face of the Witch King also. Um, that is... Um, uh, oh, good, yes. Eric Gandalf's laughter dispelling the effect of Saruman's words on Theoden and company at Isengard, right? Um, yes. Yes. Saruman, you've missed your calling in life and ought to have been a king's jester, right? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. All wonderful examples. Um, Silk Westcott, totally agree. This sounds like a great moot paper. Who's going to write this paper? Um, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Charles, you can absolutely connect it back to laughing shall I die. Why not? Why not? Um... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Anyway, um, uh, so, yes, the eucatastrophic timing of the solving of the riddle does seem to me actually to disrupt the situation. Again, I can't put myself into the head of the Watcher in the water. I don't even know what kind of a head it has, or how much of a brain it has. Um, we don't even know what kind of a thing it is, right? Um, so, you know, it's hard to imagine what it is or isn't thinking or how it might be reacting or whatever. But it seems to me pretty clear that action was imminent. That it it's not just that it was approaching. It had begun to arrive at the shore of the lake right before Gandalf left. Um, and Ga that Gandalf's laughter. And again, this, this is a luxurious scene. We don't just get a brief interruption. Again, it's not just a glance over our shoulders, right? Away from the horrible thing that's about to rise from the surface of the water. Um... It's um, we it's it's a very luxurious uh, rerouting, right? Um, 
Yeah. Does the NCC have a pool? We need a reenactment. Oh, I have an idea, Josh. We could try to reenact the approach of the ripples by the watcher in the water at Ranger Moot. So, how I told you guys about this? Ranger Moot. We are doing Kunktator knows, right? Kunktator is, is gonna be, is gonna be our host at Ranger Moot. Um, we're gonna be doing a big moot in Cincinnati on the weekend of Bilbo's birthday this year, uh, in which it's gonna be an outdoor moot. So it's it's gonna be taking place at the at a at a big uh, Boy Scout camp, um, right in Cincinnati, um, and we're gonna be there for the whole weekend. And we're going to do a bunch of reenactments because they have like a castle and a wooden palisade and a lake. Right. So like the whole theme of the like the whole focus of the um, I mean, I don't know. But there's a lot. You know, much may change. But my idea uh, for what we can do is like bunches of reenactments, like big picture. We could reenact Helm's Deep. We could reenact. Um, uh, the stockade battle with um, uh, with Haleth and uh, and and Haldad, right? Um, we could uh, we can uh, anyway. We can reenact the ripples in the lake. There's a lake we can use for this. Um, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, we'll totally um, we'll 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 work this up. <laughs> we'll work this up. So it's happening in September. Um, it's happening in September. Uh, it's going to be really cool. You can come up. Um, you can come up and camp. Uh, you know, so there's like campsites there. There are cabins there. There's hotels right down the road. Anyway, it's it's going to be really fun. Um, and of course, since the Sunday of that weekend is in fact Bilbo and Frodo's birthday, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe we will end with a reenactment of uh, of the, of the party tree uh, and all that kind of thing. Um, anyway, oh man, it's going to be so much fun, Ranger Moot. Um, yeah, Ranger Moot, September, Cincinnati. It's going to be really, really cool. Um, uh, anyway, so, um, um, <laughs> so yeah, you joke about reenacting this. This, this could really happen. This could really happen. Um, yeah, we'll have to think about how to reenact uh, the arms of the, uh, of the Watcher. But, uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, um, pool noodles. Yeah. No, we can get. We could. I. I bet you we could get a quantity of pool noodles going on. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Now yeah, we may need more than eight people to play the watcher. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So sorry, I'm getting distracted thinking about Ranger Moot now, but um, it's gonna be. Um. um it's gonna be. It's going to be really cool. So yes, we can we can absolutely reenact. There is a body of water near um, uh, near uh, the NCC where Mythmoot is, um, but it's the Potomac, so that might not work as well. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't think that would be quite as good. Anyway, um, uh, so all right. I think I had to stop while I'm ahead. All right. Um, we will return. We did, in fact, open the doors tonight. How about this? So there'll be a couple things I think I'll want to go back through and clean up and talk about a little bit more next time. And then, I believe, next time we will get to the actual attack um, uh, on, um, uh, on the... Um, by, of, of the Watcher next time so all right thanks everybody it is field trip time so thanks to folks who can only make our book discussion and we will do our field trip good evening professor good evening for Lori. how are you doing all right excellent so um can I ask one thing that I'm actually not quite sure about? Sure. Um, is the Watcher ever explicitly referred to as a Kraken, or is that something else? No. 
Yeah. Okay, because no, I think so. I figured out how why I thought this because for my entire childhood, I thought it was a kraken, mm-hmm. and I couldn't figure out where I'd gotten this idea in my head until I suddenly remembered I had a set of monster in my pocket cards <laughs> that were given to me by a neighbor's old uh, neighbor's older brother, and one of the ones was for the kraken, and it explicitly said appears in J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Oh, I see. I see. Right. So, so they were I, attributing I guess that's that. where I yeah. got it from. I guess that's where I got it from. I mean, like, why, I, I don't think they were making, I think it was an honest mistake, but it's amazing how just like little things like that just stick with you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, I think this is the first time I'm going through this package uh, passage and I'm realizing they never said it. No, I mean, again, it's, it's actually, we'll, we'll get there maybe even next week or the week after at latest, I think. Mm-hmm. To the actual descriptions of what we can see of the Watcher, which is really not very much, in fact. Um, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's pretty indeterminate what it is. Um, uh, but um, anyway, okay, so we're headed back to Moria. Back to the threshold. Yep. I mean, back to the darkness behind the doors. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, uh, Orlea, you're level fifteen. I'm not sure how much long, how how much very long you're going to last. In more yeah, areas. we are going to actually probably. Uh, yeah, no, the plan is to wander off into the uh, uh, mm-hmm. more you're dangerous w- bits here. You're welcome to come, but we cannot guarantee your safety. <laughs> we cannot guarantee your safety. That's exactly it. All Neither right, so let's just um. University are responsible. <laughs> exactly. Please sign the following waivers. Uh, so let's go upstairs. Well, no, thanks for clarifying that, clarifying that for me. I, I'm probably going to yeah, be out well, next it's, week because it's, it's spring I mean, break. Again, so. people talk about, uh, you know, I mean, uh, associate it with this, with its, with uh, some, something like a squid, something like a crack. And certainly both of those two things seem yeah. to be like what, um, uh, what Peter Jackson had in mind. Yeah, big um, old squidward looking thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but... Um, yeah, Mrs. Manrique, I, I agree. You know, um, Mrs. Manrique says, considering Tolkien structured his anthropology and zoology on the science of his day, um, I'd say it's probably its own entropy slash degraded species. Tolkien does this kind of thing a lot, right? Like, he he knows that spiders do not have stings on their abdomens. Like, Tolkien knew a good deal about, like, insects and spiders. Like, that. that's... Um, that's established, right? I, I don't think that was a mistake. Um, he knows, I believe he knows, that spiders don't have faceted eyes. Bulbous, faceted eyes like a fly. And yet the spiders in Mirkwood are described as having eyes of that kind. Sheila is, of course, obviously described as having a sting in her tail. Um, this does not mean that he doesn't know what spiders are like. He only says mm-hmm. that she's like a spider. Right, she's of spider shape. She isn't uh, yeah. a species yeah. of spider, right? And this thing, whatever it is, is not like necessarily a species of squid, exactly. Yeah, McMahon, yeah, yeah. we're gonna get to that. It's it's this is something quite different. But that doesn't mean that it's totally inappropriate to be thinking in terms of like parallels and um, you know, kind of models and things that was that we can you know, ways in which we can understand it. But um, anyway, OK, so the thing that most in- so we're now we're back up to our four way intersection and we are now going to continue on into the great delving here. Um, and. Um, OK, so um, the thing that interests me most about. So this we are standing in front of. The entrance to the entire kingdom of Moria from here. Yeah. Right? You've yeah. just entered in through the back door. And you mm-hmm. and this is and like by Moria standards, this is a dinky little 
side door. I mean, look at how tiny this is. Look at the yeah. huge archways off to the guest areas and the waiting pools and the and the you know like the hot tub and the forges, and this is the merest postern gate. I mean, look at this. This is teensy. Yeah, this is so non grandiose. Yeah. yeah, it's defensible though. Well, that's true. That's true. They don't have gates, so it's not designed as an actively def an active defensive structure. But yeah. there is a sort of choke point here, it's true. Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's definitely one of those, you know, our guests are here, they're cleaned up, they're changed, their horses are watered, time to take them through the guest rooms. Yeah, it's just, it's interesting to me that um, this, because this, and this is just sort of the beginning, right? The hallway mm -hmm. in here looks nice and is sort of of a piece of the arches and the hallway with the, with the arches and the hallways outside, right? And we've got yeah. the nice fancy ceilings like we had in the side galleries and all that sort yeah. of thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, then we go through this second archway and now we're, so now it's always hard to tell exactly what is ruinous and what is like what was just rough originally. Yeah. Um, it's one of the things that I, I, I hope we can maybe get better at. Like this looks like ruin. I think this was, uh, yeah. this is broken. So this used to be nicer than it currently is. So let's well, assume. you to find the library. Yeah, we go straight to the library here. Yeah. Um, so let's assume that when we go through that little hallway, Everything design here on the cover. was still built up. This what sound on the cover of what the book? On the book, yeah, like a little laurel wreath. Yeah, like they're reading Dante. <laughs> I like the old. Um, I mean, the spine looks like an old, like a, uh, like a a novel from like a nineteen twenties you know, publication series or something. Uh, yeah, it looks like a it looks like a pasteboard and canvas cover. It really does. Yeah. It um, came from the Shire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's really interesting. Oh no, they wouldn't well, only Balin brought it with him. Right, I guess it could be a Yeah, these know. look there's these look more archaic. Here we have some more leather bound and right, leather covers with a metal clasp here. Yeah. This one looks like it has a metal cover. Oh, you got one with the metal this cover over there? Definitely looks elvish. It has these swooping swooping lines on everything. Very yeah. thin, very slim. Sorry, I like these books. Are, these are huge books. Look at these. These books are like four feet high. They're like atlases. Well, if we've seen the maps of this place, it's understandable if they're atlases. Yeah. Wow. This, these are tremendously Records. huge shelves. Keeping track of the incarnations of Durin. Yeah, I mean, look at the look at the Hobbit. Look at our our friend Pineleaf here. Yeah, right? standing up next to the books. Look at that. These books are taller than a Hobbit. Well, yeah, and, and you know, a, a dwarf-sized person wouldn't have much more luck. Yeah, yeah, You'd exactly. Need a couple of people to get it down. Right to the dwarves, these books would be would be whole body size. It's really interesting. The ones on the floor are not that size, but the ones on the shelves yeah. are. Yeah. Everything's big in Moria. Um, okay, so <laughs> so again, I'm assuming I'm assuming that all of this was finished, right? And you know, we have this nice like uh, stone with inset marble, and I have to say, they really like mixing their design concepts, right? I mean, talk it's it's like the interior decoration of Moria. I mean, right, it, it's like wearing plaid and polka dots at the same time. I mean, it's uh, yeah, yeah. Or like, you know, one of those places in a house where you like stand in one room and you see four different kinds of flooring from where you're standing, right? Like it's it's sort of like that, right? With all of the different yeah styles and and like i mean just like the columns have the 
the the the rings and diamonds and the knotwork and then at the base you have that like those square panels that look like a a sun or a web or the something Bronze like Age that. Bronze Age looking loops. Yeah. Right. And then the yes and then the like inset brass or copper thing. I mean it's just so many patterns all over the place. A lot of it just showing off what they could do. Yeah. More is more is more. More is more. That explains um, a lot about dwarves, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but we have this what was this the Chamber of Deep Thought? Yep. I have to think. Um <clears throat> I have to think that this is designed in part at least to be like this I mean it can't be a coincidence that the you know this library in the chamber of deep thought is right by the elf entrance right oh yeah this is this is definitely the public library <laughs> the public library exactly so it's where that you know you could just pop by from a regian to to borrow a book uh, from the dwarves yeah yeah. No, it's more like these are the books they're allowed to read. That's right. We will allow you to... And that's how they keep the elves from walking away with them. They only put the enormous books here that you couldn't possibly make out with. It's like... Uh, it's almost like, you know, the 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 having like a cinder block on the key ring for the the door of a uh, of a of of a gas station bathroom you know like or gluing a newspaper to a giant plank of wood yeah <laughs> exactly yeah you couldn't possibly uh make off with that here um oh i'm yeah. sorry you're having a bit trouble with that eh? <laughs> i mean they couldn't sneak it past the 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 guys at the door down the stairs certainly yeah yeah <laughs> they could glide down like a skateboard do that legless do the legless like shield book, move. book surfing is what you're suggesting yeah, book surfing yeah, yeah okay. there we go All right um but if you good luck getting past the doors <laughs> right but if instead of thinking of it in this kind of suspicious way we instead think of it as um you know, a place of collaborative learning right um mm -hmm. Uh, with the with the elves and Dizzy, you're right. There aren't any uh, ladders to reach the top shelves. I'm going to charitably assume that there were ladders and that like something happened to the ladders. That the ladders, yeah, the big were, old tall Beauty and the Beast kind you can ride around on, were broken down or whatever else. But yeah. anyway, yeah. So this this was a place for learning and collaboration, like the collaboratory, Cal Elros, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. This, uh, this is where Celebrimbor probably was allowed to sit in. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so this was so you came if you came straight through and go straight to the right, then you get yeah. there. What happens if you go straight to the left? You get into this larger hall with stalactites and whoa. Yeah. Um oh we got over there. Well, that ain't good. There. Uh that is a I don't know, somebody killed it. Uh, no, that was it was an arc. It was a named arc. Oh, who was intimidating uh, this Oh, dwarf Chieftain over. Lurk. That's appropriate. Yeah. Chieftain Lurk was... Right? Lurking over He was there. lurking. He was. He was absolutely lurking. Okay. So now, the stalactites... They have to have been there. Uh, possibly not as big, though. Yeah, stalactites of that size would not have formed in a mere couple thousand years. Oh, yeah, no, a, they just probably, take a long they probably just added to what it had. Yeah, yeah, so, um... Oh, so, are you looking at the bridge across from us? Because you can see the, the rock growth for, on the underside. Oh, on the underside of the bridge? Yeah, the, across from here. If you look, if you look, uh... Oh, northeast. over there, yeah. Well, look at that. Yeah, you can yeah. see that's a dwarf-made structure that is now right. sprouted mineral deposits. Interesting. Okay. So those would definitely have grown since the bridge was made. But mm -hmm. as Khazad Doom dates back to the First Age, you've got a good deal longer. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, if presumably... Durin came here comparatively fresh 
from um, naming the nameless hills and dells, then Casa Doom would have been for. And I assume in game there's going to be some kind of discussion of timeline since with the whole Gundabad thing, and I haven't played Gundabad yet, so I don't know what they've done with that. But yeah, um, me neither. In any case, um, my point is the fall of Moria was only just just a little more than a thousand years ago from the current time of the game. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas the... Um, again, the, the original forming of this place was a lot longer than that. Oh, yeah. Um, but I, that is interesting. It is interesting that they have really long, really big stalag- stalactites hanging from under the dwarf-made structures. Makes me want to see if there are ones under the one that we're standing on. But it's probably not safest to try to look at that from here. So, um, well, let me see what I can see from here. But anyway, looking back up. Oh uh, yeah, there are. There are. Yeah, there I absolutely. thought there might yeah, there be. There absolutely are. Um, but I'm still gonna say that those stalactites were there. So. This is definitely, again, I'm asking myself, um, rough or ruin, right? Um, mm. Is is this, and I think, I think rough. This, they put up these walls, but it was, they wanted to preserve this rough um, hall here, this chamber, mm-hmm. this big, huge natural cave. So they cre- they make different bridges. We can see these, you know, we can, there's the one that we're on and those two others that we see at different levels across the mm-hmm. way. Um, the I fact love the that fact we're not... that, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. The fact that we don't see any stalactites on the bridge itself though, indicates there's some kind of drainage and that might explain the mineral deposits underneath. Yep, yep, yeah, it might. It might. I was just going to say I love even just in this first glimpse. So on the one hand, to one extent this has not quite given me, like, our first glimpses into you know, inside Casa Doom proper haven't yeah. given me exactly what I expected to find, which was, mm-hmm. like, gorgeousness and grandeur of dwarf construction, Right. Yeah, Instead, still seems kind of abandoned. Right. right. Well, it's it's like rough caves, mostly, yeah. right? W- rough caves with some things built in them, which, again, is not, not quite what I was expecting. But what we can see is the a, 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 a taste of the scope of things, right? From where we're standing, we can see this other bridge that's a little bit on a little bit higher level than the one that we're on. And then we can see down below another bridge going in a different direction at a much lower level. And then if we keep mm-hmm. looking down, we can see yet a third bridge, fourth if you count the one that we're standing on, um, going in a different direction and down at, the, at an even lower level. And you can see the level down below that. And then if you look way down this, you can't even see where wow. this you know, current uh, cavern ends down below. Yeah. So the sense of like just the scope of things, um, yeah, the that scale this is only, is just yeah, nominal. This is just one cavern, and it's like a pretty narrow cavern, right? It's not like mm-hmm. it's expansive, but but just this one little glimpse of what they were working in, how this this huge, multi-layer, enormously expansive city slash kingdom, um, that. Um, uh, that we see uh, going on here, it's it's I I, th- I think it's a really fun um, first taste of what Moria is like here, and we, and of course from a within game perspective, we can begin to see how complicated it's going to be to navigate around in here. Oh uh, yeah, I again I am just. I am still gobsmacked at the scale they made this place and consistently made this place all the way through. Yeah. 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 It's, um, it's pretty amazing. Um, it's so we're going to be here a while guys. (laughs) We are, we are. All right. So, um, it's, um, 
we've got our doorway across there, and then looks like some stairs headed down uh, towards the lower levels within that sort of little rock formation there above us. Um, mm-hmm. The other bridge that we're looking at with the stalag with the stalactites across the way looks like it might have come up from the third direction that we didn't go down. Um, which we can maybe look at next time as well. Let's peek through here and see what we see. Oh, we've discovered something. Schemeldurge, huh? Okay, we've discovered Schemeldurge. I don't know what that means. Lots of spider webs. Yeah, well, there's that. So we go down. <gasps> Can you? <laughs> I can't imagine anyone could go down those steps quickly, gracefully. You'd look like a slinky. <laughs> going from side to side like a mechanical penguin. <laughs> yeah, and um, okay. Nothing in there. So this nope. hallway is designed to go around that way. Is, is there uh-huh. anything in this little hole over here? Not that I see. Because this definitely looks like a, a sort of fissure that's open. Oh, weird. It's just kind of weirdly empty in here, huh? Yep. Maybe it's a spawn point. So this was bricked up by the dwarves? This empty little cave was just bricked up for some reason. Maybe? Or maybe there was maybe a Maybe it was a Maybe it was like a storage area and there used to be a doorway here, but it all collapsed. Or maybe huh. something moved and there was like a I don't know, like is what's the rock equivalent of a cyst? <laughs> I don't know if there is one. Um, like okay. a, a gas could be a pocket of gas okay or it's a storage unit uh, mm, no nah, well, that's uh, it's another can't cave get, can't get over that I mean, look at that hole four floors worth of galleries over there yeah. Looks really Yeah, cool. it's like cloisters or something. Yeah. Multi level. Big old door. Man, what oh, yeah, was you can this? see some more of it over here. I have no memory of this place. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, Ilex. Oh, hey, is this a dead end? Um, it is. Delightful. Uh, maybe. Very good. Is this always here? Yeah, I don't I'm remember so confused. this either. How do they? Wow. Okay, so, so what they dragged yeah, it, the Ilex? It looks like here, it looks like they have re- 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 rearranged some things because, uh, yeah, this is news to me. Oh, well. Okay. How do we get to the dolphin view? This is, this so is madness. Off, yeah, we're off in the corner. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the dolphin view is way, way in the other direction. Yeah. Okay. But I'm delighted that we've come to a dead end because that's an excellent stopping place. And that means we don't yeah. have to come back in this direction next time because we've already followed it to the to the to to the bitter end here. Yep, say goodbye um, to Dagfin. We ain't seen him again. <laughs> that's this guy. This guy, Dagfin, yes. This guy, Dagfin. Yep. Yep. Um what is Dagfin doing? Maybe he's trying to get the glow crystal out of here so it can be used somewhere else. Yeah, it's like mining it so that it can be... Well, and here, of course, we see it growing straight out of the ground, so it's clear that it's just a purely natural phenomenon. Yeah. Whether the source of it is further down and he has to uncover it, or whether it can be rekindled through some process, or whether it's just a, a, a prism for light. Right. I like the colors in it, though. Yes. The opalescent colors. The crystal, I mean, of course, 
thinking outside of our normal approach to these things, um, the crystals are a really interesting solution by the devs for the obvious problem of exploring in the deep dark of Moria for the like months or years that it takes people to do all of Moria and that is the darkness right like how do you mm-hmm. um, you don't actually want to have a perfectly dark um, you know caverns everywhere yep um, and yeah hear that Hollywood torches. people don't like darkness <laughs> people don't like darkness exactly um, so but it is it does create um, I think some interesting story elements as we think, especially again as we think of imagining what things used to be. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, all right. Well, let's um, mm-hmm. let's call it right here. It's getting late, so sure. um, next time we will. So we've been to the library. We've been down this part, which again would have been where elves were. Being in, maybe this was like a place where elves could come and stay. I don't know. This isn't like the elvish living quarters yet, exactly. Yeah, but yeah you'd assume they'd have some sort of guest quarters somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I don't know maybe that this that... is it, but um, but it is right next oh. to the entrance. You know, that was yeah. wh- where we got when we took a left, right at right inside the front door there. So um, next time we will continue straight away and try to figure out the mystery of the path towards the Dolvin View. Um, all right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you guys again next week. Bye now. Bye.